Hello, I'm Tara Brabazon. I'm the Dean of Graduate Research at Flinders University and welcome to Vlog 99, Multimodality. And this vlog comes via request from Amir. Amir, I think, heard me use the word multimodality in an earlier vlog and wanted a little bit of flesh around those bones. So Amir, my absolute pleasure and indeed multimodality is one of the key words, I would argue, in knowledge development right now. So we're going to spend a bit of time on this concept on this trope and on this theory. We'll provide some basic definitions and then how it can transform how you think about your research project and how you disseminate your research. So this could be a bit of a transformative day for you. But let's start with the easy definition and let's break the word down into its basic parts. Multi-modality. Right. Multi means many, but de. Mode means the platform, the form, the interface that we're discussing, the channel of communication. And alate comes from the French alate, from the Latin alatas. And it means the condition or the state of the previous word. So we think about physicality, it is the state or condition of being physical. Corporeality, the state or the condition of being of the body, and of course, multimodality, the state or the condition of being multimodal. Okay, so multimodality refers to the multiple channels of communication that exist in our daily life, how we experience life, how we experience ideas through diverse modes of communication. It also recognises and is challenged by digitisation because it recognises that digitisation allows all sorts of sources to move through space and time at speed. So there are powerful consequences for modality, particularly in terms of building an information scaffold. So the information scaffold is like a ladder. It starts us with our most basic literacies, what's often called everyday literacies, that we gain through socialisation as children. But then it provides an information scaffold and moves us to more complicated ideas and a diversity of platforms. And that's what the information scaffold does at its best. It takes us from where we are comfortable, where we know what's going on, to something a bit more confronting, a bit more complex, a bit more challenging. So it takes our experience in one mode and then just pushes us through diverse modes of communication and more complicated ideas in communication so that we learn. So, for example, you may have a love of popular music. You've got great high-level literacy in popular music. You understand melody, you understand harmony, you understand voice, you understand rhythm. So what I would try to do using an information scaffold is take your ability in popular music and then find strategies to move that expertise through sonic media more generally. So I would find a strategy or a way in which you have that great expertise in the consumption of popular music, but how could I teach you to be a producer of sonic media? So podcasts, audiobooks, new ways to disseminate your research through sound. So we take an already existing expertise in one mode of knowledge and then move it to another. So multimodality allows you to take skills and abilities that you're comfortable with and test yourself with consciousness in a new space and time. So let's use writing as an example. Writing transforms quite a lot when we're writing on paper and we are writing on a screen, right? And there are lots of reasons for that. In fact, when we're drafting PhDs, I spend a lot of time, I draft on paper differently from how I draft on a screen. So drafting on a screen is great. We find all sorts of different errors and we're able to track change those errors. But because the screen is shorter, than a piece of paper, it tends to truncate what we're looking at. It frames the prose in a different way. So particularly if I've got students with challenges in paragraphing, I spend a lot of time drafting on paper because an A4 piece of paper is bigger, longer if you will, than a screen. So ideas can be extended and explored in different ways. We see different things. Our visual literacy is different when applied to a piece of paper or to a screen. So let's use another example. Most of us still learn how to write on paper. 
and yet we've got all these new ways of expressing ourselves of which text messaging is the great and controversial example. And all these fantastic studies have been enacted about how text messaging is actually transforming how we write in the rest of our life. And I find that really, really interesting. So how the truncated vocabulary is impacting on schools, on universities and on formal learning environments. Now, what multimodality does is it creates an intervention. It enables all of us to understand what is the best way to express ourselves on multiple platforms. So with consciousness and literacy, we understand, right, but when we text message, we use this type of vocabulary. When I'm writing a PhD, I use this type of vocabulary. And you know what? There's probably not a lot of blurring there. So multimodality provides consciousness about literacy to reflect on that relationship between form and content, the medium of communication and the content of information. So therefore, media literacy, information literacy is all part of what we're dealing with here. And our goal is to help you move between platforms with consciousness so you can express your ideas effectively. Right. Most importantly, I think, multimodality is the skill that allows us to create inclusive communication systems. Because the key principle in all of this, the reason why we're doing this, is the platform you select determines the audience for your work. So if you're interested in getting your research to particular groups of stakeholders in the culture, you have to know what platform your stakeholders are using, what their literacy is, and that's how you craft the information. So if you are interested in the dissemination of research, and my goodness me, you should be, if you're interested in impact narratives, boom, then you have to work out the identity of the audience you would like to reach and select the form and content that allows you to get there. So let me give you an example of multimodality in marketing when things haven't gone too well. Now in the old days, which is basically a couple of months ago, no I'm joking, in the old days marketers used to phone our landlines, our homes at 6pm. Most of us would be home, we'd be cooking dinner, we'd be eating dinner and marketers would phone up and ask us questions about trying to sell us new paid television services, new cars, try and do a survey with us and people would go stark raving mad. They would scream, they would go absolutely crazy, why are you doing this to me, you are ruining my life, right? And of course then answer phones happen, so people just let the phone go, never return the call people like me don't even have landlines okay so you want to try and reach me on a landline you yeah, have no chance no chance because I don't have a landline right so in marketing terms this is not going well so the message has not go through, gone through so it is necessary using multimodality theory to change platforms and that's what marketers did because they had to convey and construct information in a way that it would be read and the way to do that is <laughs> people love their mobile phones. They have no literacy in their mobile phones, but they love their mobile phones. So they carry it with them randomly at all times, and like a beep goes, and what do people do immediately? Beep! Like wherever they are. Because I'm popular. I'm popular. See, I'm popular. They never turn the phone off, they never put it in the silent, they never leave it in their bag. They just go, look at me, I'm popular, right? So the literacy <laughs> for mobile phones is very, very low. So marketers use this. They know that people are connected to their mobile phone. They have no understanding how to use it, how to turn it off. So they send a message through and it will be immediately read. Fantastic for marketers, interesting for the rest of us. So advertisers are playing with multimodality, playing with us and playing with our lack of literacy with mobile telephony. So the landline doesn't work, people are yet to actually develop proper mobile phone literacy and uh, yeah, winning for advertisers for the moment, we'll learn. So multimodality allows you to make concrete, conscious choices about platform selection. So let me give you other examples of when multimodality gets it wrong. Dumping people by text message, you dumped, you dumped. You, dump. you know the people that announce pregnancies on Facebook? Bless. Uh, and also the people who, when they're writing a lecture or a seminar on PowerPoint, they put every word that they're going to say on the PowerPoint slide and then they proceed to read it during the talk. Always remember, PowerPoint, 
visual aid, not talk visual aid, different. So multimodality in visual communication allows us to place attention on images, on words, on language, on font selection, but also on white space. All sorts of design potentials exist for us. And so with sonic media, we might use melody, harmony, pitch, pace, tone, but also silence. And I'm always very interested in olfactory media, so what we smell. So that smell of freshly brewed coffee, how that makes us feel, freshly baked bread, sour milk. Olfactory media is fascinating, by the way. We, we lack literacy. We don't have the language to describe what we smell, but it taps very, very deeply into memory. So I'm sure most of us have that experience of we suddenly smell something and we're back to when we were five. So it's very interesting when we're doing oral history work to use olfactory media, use smell, to get people thinking about memory. So that's multimodality. What we're trying to do is actually create modality, modality. So a mixing of information and a media platform that's believed. So the definition of modality is a formation that we treat as true, as real, and as trustworthy. So there's all sorts of modality cues that exist in our life and our media. So for example, a bloke in a suit is trusted. Yeah. So that's why a newsreader, the person conveying the truth through news, the newsreader is in a suit, he has a low voice, and he's speaking directly to the camera because he is trustworthy. He is a newsreader. Okay, so modality cues are based on our experiences of the world, our experiences of a medium. So as we become more experienced in life, we become more experienced in modality. We know what is trustworthy and we know what is not. And this type of information helps us a lot in understanding who is literate in particular types of information. By the way, this is also the reason that we try to protect children in the media too, because their modality experiences are not yet fully developed, so they tend to trust everything that they see. Yep, so while they're developing that socialisation and experiential ideologies, we just have to make sure they're looked after so they don't realise that if you drink Coke, then life will be terrific, because that's what the ads say. And we know, of course, Coke, mm, probably not. So we therefore need a lot more attention to the audience of information. Like, and this was what made me crazy for 20 years. The assumption that everyone is online, okay? I've, I've been in seminars and lectures for 20 years, and people have gone, oh, look, everyone's online. Look, not everyone is online in the United States of America, let alone the Democratic Republic of the Congo. And also, we mustn't make assumptions about the age, the gender, the sexuality, the race of people online. Again, this makes me crazy. We have 20 years of fantastic longitudinal studies about who is online and who is not, and who's using different platforms. We don't need the assumptions anymore. So all the stuff about the young people being online, I mean, wow, this is just nonsense. Let's get into social media. The average age of a LinkedIn user is 44.3. The average age of a Twitter user is 39.1. The average age of a Facebook user is 38.4. So when people go, the young people on Facebook, it's like, you are just wrong, dude. You are just wrong. So therefore, understanding multimodality means we're able to, with care and respect and consciousness, match an audience with a platform, with the information we want to convey. So always ask, what is the most effective platform to convey your information? So Gunther Kress, I'm a big fan. Gunther Kress is the international theorist of multimodality. And he developed social semiotics with Bob Hodge, Robert Hodge, uh, through the 1980s, big respect for the legendary Bob Hodge. And through the 1990s, Gunther Kress became fascinated with how images work. Through the 2000s, multimodality became his concern. What's the best use of media platforms for specific audiences? So the key questions for you as a researcher in your application of multimodality are as follows. Ask yourself, what are you trying to achieve? What sort of information are you trying to convey? And who is your audience? So multimodality matters now more than ever. Why? 
because of globalisation. Now, I very rarely use the word globalisation. It's used too often in a, and in a glib way, to be frank. But I'm actually interested in the impact of digitisation on globalisation because this means that all sorts of ideas move often in a cascading way through time and space without consciousness. That's what globalisation and digitisation do. So it means we rarely think about the best use of information and how it is best moved because it just sort of moves. You press forward on an email and stuff goes anywhere. I'll give you an example of where consciousness and care can make a real difference here. There are so many multilinguistic environments around us and words don't always help in these types of environments. And that's why I love so much design. Design is so important to think about multimodality, how we design an information experience for a group of users. And I have a wonderful master's student, Sayed Al Almudi. Hi to wonderful Sayed. I taught him for his master's. He's now Dr. Sayed Al Almudi. He had a great PhD at the University of Salford. Sayed, so proud of him. But when he was working on his master's with me, he investigated Mecca and the challenge of the Hajj, the pilgrimage, as a multilinguistic environment. So, of course, Mecca is a very complicated second tier city because reasonably quiet most of the time, then the pilgrimage happens and millions of people suddenly arrive there. It's a multilinguistic environment. So, how do we ensure that everybody's safe and protected, but also these incredibly beautiful special historical objects that people are visiting are also respected and cared for? And Sayed came up with a series of images, designed images, that showed the behaviour around these objects and around the spaces of Mecca. So a great example there of multimodality. You can't use words because of the multilinguistic environment. You've got to be respectful in terms of faith structures, but also how do we steer and configure behavior? So fantastic example there. Multimodality, knowing when words work and knowing when images will work better. So therefore, digitization is the key moment in thinking through multimodality. You know what? It may not always be appropriate that particular words and ideas move through space and time. Digitization allows us to do it, but just because you can do something doesn't mean that you should. So for example, the very delicate and specialist information and knowledge systems of indigenous communities, you know, that is very specific and bespoke and we need care and dignity and respect in handling that information. Just because an image is digitised and can move doesn't mean that it should. So this is a big area, I think, for future discussion. And indeed, Gunther Kress realised that the greater the cultural difference, the greater the differences in terms of representational systems and literacies. So much of the way in which a text can be seen to be real, important and true depends on its medium, its platform and its form. So if I write something in a scholarly monograph, it's believed. If I do it in expressive dance, perhaps it won't be. So writing, for example, has a lower modality than television and film. If we see something, we believe it. If something's written about, we perhaps believe it less. So therefore, we can never, as researchers, assume our understanding of information is shared by others. What works for us in universities may not work beyond universities. So multimodality asks that we all explore the key questions. How, where and why content moves and how we transform that content through the diverse screens of our lives. How does information change when it's in a text message compared to an enormous mega screen? How should our vocabulary, our sentence construction, our attention to refereeing be altered for a blog in comparison to a PhD? So knowing that inevitably all these different skills are going to be required by the contemporary researcher, the media literacy that we require to tailor that content for a particular audience is of a very, very high order. So the question is how we balance the speed of, say, a micro-blogging service like Twitter with the calibre and the quality of research we require in quality-enhanced environments like universities. So as you can see, media literacy, information literacy and yes, multimodality align. 
And there's never been a greater choice of media and platforms than there is right now. It's never been easier to move information through platforms. But just because you can move information does not mean that you should. So we need a series of mitigating steps and questions. Who is the audience for your material? What is the context for that information? And indeed, what are you trying to achieve with that information, with that research? These questions are multimodal questions and should and indeed must transform how you think about the parameters and the limitations of your PhD and also how you disseminate your PhD research. Indeed, multimodality is a key way of thinking about your PhD and the way to express your arguments. And that's why when I introduced the session today, I talked about the framework around your PhD because the digital PhD, and PhDs are now digital, the digital PhD, the boundaries, the parameters of it are now porous. So let me show you an analogue thesis. This is my research masters when dinosaurs roamed the earth. But yes, it was multimodal. Its framework, its boundaries were indeed porous because I had an appendix here. My masters, by the way, my research masters was on the visual history of the Beatles. My argument was that actually people talk about how great the Beatles were in terms of popular music history and the innovation of their sound. My argument was in terms of Beatlemania and the first five years that their visual contribution is what made them popular rather than their music. So in other words, the mop top haircuts, the Rickenbackers, the Chelsea boots and so forth, the suits, that's what created Beatlemania. The first album was mainly made up of covers. Important to remember. But anyway, so, so therefore it was important for me to really think about visuality in this thesis because I was arguing about the importance of the visual. So I intentionally made the sonic component an appendix. So, so the sonic, the sound bit, was secondary to the images. So yes, for the young people out there, that's a thing called an audio cassette. Ah. So I put in place sonic footnotes. So as the examiners move through this thesis, they were then able to, as a secondary manifestation, go to the back and hear a sonic footnote. But sound was always secondary division. So even in analog environments for theses, you could be thinking about multimodality. And for example, my current student, Mark Brown, hi Mark. Mark is constructing a series of podcasts and videos where he's showing his artifacts. So in the actual script of the thesis, he is referring outward to the artifacts he has made, the digital platforms. So as you can see, the very framework of a PhD, the boundaries of a PhD are transforming. So always remember, post your PhD, think about the audience for your research and how you can control and shape and frame how your information moves with great effectiveness. And look, that may be via blogs, vlogs like this. It might be through podcasts, the use of sound. It may be via tweets. So think about the audience that you want to reach and the best use of your fantastic research. So, well, we got here. Can I say it's been a crazy morning? I cannot tell you what's been happening this morning. We got there. But as always, I wish you love, light and peace. Take care. Bye-bye.